go to scientific meetings and we'd sit down for a beer after dinner and I'd say, you know, you can study these, you just need private money. And it went from, you know, needing a million to needing two million to meeting, needing four million. And there were a lot of naysayers in what I'll call the psychedelic community on the West Coast that I knew, good friends of mine, and I'd talk about it and they'd say, oh, no, 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 the government will never let you do that. The government will never let anybody do research. These things are too powerful and people in government see how powerful they are. And I said, I just don't believe that. I just don't believe it. And uh, <clears throat> so I was sitting around telling this story sometime in the late 90s for the umpteenth time, and it, by that time I think I'd gotten up to the point where I said, you need a $10 million endowment or something like that. And I went home from that meeting, and I said, you know, I've told the same story so many times, and I said, I'll be retired, sitting in my rocking chair, 80 years old, telling the same story, and nobody will have done it. And I hadn't done it because I didn't have an MD and couldn't give these drugs to humans, which I thought was really the most interesting aspect. And so I called a bunch of friends of mine who were psychiatrists and PhDs, and I said, you know, I want to set up an institute to study these. I think we can do it, and there must be a lot of private donors out there who would be willing to support this, so let's do it. So we were incorporated in 1993 uh, in, New, in New Mexico, which was a, a state that was easier to get incorporated than Indiana, where I am, or some of the other states. So we sort of started from that perspective, and in the beginning, the idea was that we would focus on both preclinical and clinical, you know, uh, supports investigators who are studying how these things work in the brain, mechanism of action studies. But what we found was there weren't that many people out there who had the resources that would part with them. So in Silicon Valley, we kept hearing stories of, oh yeah, this person you know, took LSD and it was very profound and then they had this big fortune based on their software company and then, and then you'd approach those people and they wouldn't be interested at all. So I think naively in the beginning I thought that a lot of the people who had been very successful and who were LSD had inspired some of their thinking, especially in the Silicon Valley computer crowd. I naively thought that maybe they would be willing to, you know, hey, these really helped me, let's see if... But that, that didn't prove to be the case. Finding donors has really been the choke point for this whole area. And uh, we eventually got a couple of donors. We had Bob Wallace, who I think was the ninth employee at uh, Microsoft. And he was the mainstay of Hefter for many years until his uh, unfortunate and unexpected death. And then we have come in to meet a couple of other donors who have kept us afloat, but we, we're not really uh, <laughs> very uh, cash rich, let's say. We're a virtual institute. So most of our money goes directly into the studies uh, that we support. Um, and we continue to do that. We supported, um, we put in the lion's share of support for the study of psilocybin and OCD at University of Arizona. I think we put something like 50,000 in that study. And Charlie Grobe's study at UCLA of psilocybin in terminal patients, uh, we supported that. Um, we're currently supporting two other studies, uh, one at New York University by Steve Ross, which is an extension of what Charlie Grobe did. Charlie Grobe enrolled 12 patients. And uh, the New York University study will enroll, I believe, 33 patients with a higher dose and a, a better statistical design, a little bit. We think that's going to be a better study. And I don't know they're sort of a third, a third of the way into uh, the treatments, I think. And then Roland Griffiths is doing another study at Johns Hopkins uh, with psilocybin and cancer patients. But in his case, the, the patients don't have to be terminal. They just have to have been in progression for about a year. So we think that if the Hopkins study and the New York University study, which will enroll a total of, I think, 77 patients, we take the 12 from Charlie's UCLA study, we've got 89 patients. If we can show uh, effects in these other two studies that we, that we think we can show based on the preliminary results that Charlie Grove got, we think we'll have a large enough body of data that maybe we can go to the government at that point. And there are some uh, initiatives out of the government to uh, for ideas to improve the quality of life for people at the end of life. And if we can show that, you know, we've treated 89 patients with this material and, and for every, you know, if we have a statistically significant improvement in mood and de de decrease in anxiety and, you know, a, a host of other things we're looking at, we think that may be convincing enough to get a fairly large grant from the government set up a multi-center study to expand that. So that would sort of be the beginning of, uh, of that uh, whole area if, if, if that works out, but we're still looking at a few years to go before those studies are done. Um, I guess the proof of principle for this whole thing was Rick Strassman's study. 
Um, I met Rick Strassman at Esalen in 1984, and we had extensive discussions about clinical studies of psychedelics, and a lot of the people at that uh, conference were of the sort of naysayer variety, and Rick Strassman was a psychiatrist at the University of New Mexico, assistant professor, and I said, you know, why don't you do it, Rick? And he'd been interested, and so we actually talked about the possibilities that we could do that, and uh, he got really excited. The department head out there had had come from, I believe, Chicago, and was a had expertise in designing uh, inst rating instruments for psychiatric uh, studies, and designed the hallucinogen with Rick designed the hallucinogen rating scale. And uh, he gave, you know, as you may know, gave DMT to human volunteers intravenously, and uh, wrote this book, DMT: The Spirit Molecule. There's now a movie that's been completed that'll be out sometime uh, in the near future. DMT: The Spirit Molecule. And Mitch started, Schultz. Yeah, Mitch Schultz, right. And uh, so I think his studies were published in 93, 94, and that was the point where peop all the naysayers said, oh, you can do it. You know, and Rick had gone through all the hurdles. There had been a change at the Food and Drug Administration that made it possible, but really up to that point, I don't think anybody with qualifications had tried, and this was the, this was the real problem. You had psychologists or you had... Uh, clinical psychiatrists in private practice, and if they wrote something up to try to use LSD, they didn't know how to write it up, they didn't know the protocol, the experimental design, and I think Strassman was probably the first qualified psychiatrist who really made a serious attempt and, of course, demonstrated proof of principle, and at that point, then, people said, oh, you, you can do these studies, and that was, at, you know, that sort of corresponded with the point in time at which the Hefter Institute was founded. And who was Hefter? Arthur Hefter, it's interesting that you asked me that because we had, we've had receptions uh, in, in the West Coast for the Institute, and Ralph Metzner, who should be one of the most knowledgeable people out there, at one of the early receptions said, Dave, who is Arthur Hefter? Arthur Hefter uh, was a, a brilliant scientist who lived in the uh, turn of the century, 1800s to 1900s. He had a PhD in chemistry, he had a PhD in pharmacology, and had an MD. Um, he was a brilliant guy that was a distinguished professor in both Germany and in Switzerland. And he did things, for example, he discovered the hair test for arsenic. So if someone was poisoned with arsenic, the hair test uh, was the thing he invented, which unfortunately now hasn't been applied to drug testing. But uh, <laughs> arsenic, you know, arsenic test uh, in hair, uh, he did a lot of things. He did a lot of things. Um, and in fact, he was a very atypical German guy, because back in those days, if you were a professor in a German institution, uh, everything that came out of the lab had your name on it, and you were the big guy. You were the, the top professor. And after he died, they had a sort of memorial service years later, and his, his students were there to talk about his life. And one of his students says, you know, we'll probably never know all the ideas that Hefter had, because quite often, you know, he would tell one of his students uh, or associates about something, and they would do the work, and they'd come in, and they'd get ready to publish and put his name. He said, no, 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 don't put my name on. You did all the work. And you know, they said, but your idea. No, no, you did all the work. It was unheard of at the time. Anyway, um, I tried to find somebody to name the institute after who would represent sort of the ideals of what we had. And the thing that Arthur Hefter did was, uh, in the 1890s, uh, took peyote cactus and isolated the various alkaloids, took them himself, and established that mescaline was the active component in peyote. Um, and that was published uh, in a German journal, and he established the uh, experiment, let's see, Society for Experimental Pharmacology and Therapeutics. He was really a leader, an early leader in the field. And that experiment was, at the time, was described as one of the greatest pharmacological experiments of the era. So he was the one who really took mescaline out of peyote, identified it, took it, and said, "This is the active ingredient." Published a, a, you know, a description of the effects with a timeline, etc. So it was really way before sort of Albert Hoffman did his thing, and he was f really forgotten uh, because uh, mescaline wasn't that important back then. Uh, you couldn't get synthetic mescaline until about 1920. And then, you know, a few dilettantes and artists took it from time to time. You know, Aldous Huxley took it in the 50s. But it really did not have the effect on society. So Hefter, Hefter's name was kind of lost. And uh, if you read the stories about him, his family and his friends, he, everybody just loved him. He was, he, was, uh, he was fond of classical music, and he just was a kind of a Renaissance guy. He was a public health official. 
that testified against uh, uh, dangerous practices in manufacturing. They were using, I believe, lead liners in beer bottles when they started bottling and the lead was leaching into the beer and he testified against that and said you've got to get these out of there. And so he really was kind of a man of the people but yet, you know, two PhDs and an MD and amazing guy. His family still has reunions and if I remember correctly, something like 70-80% of his descendants are professional people with MDs and PhDs. So very high functioning guy, uh, really well known and, and loved at the time. But you know, nobody knows about him today. Uh, the first time his family met for reunion, they just got on the internet, and this is years and years ago when the internet was just kind of getting up, and they just Googled Arthur Hefter just to see if there was anything out there. And the only thing they found was the Hefter Institute. And we have a biography published. Actually, people could go to hefter.org and read it. It's very interesting. Describes uh, a lot about him. We've got a few pictures there. Probably uh, more about Hefter on our website than any place else in the world. Please talk about the Purdue University Library's archives and special collections on psychedelic drugs. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, <clears throat> one of the board members on Hefter, it came, it, she sort of realized, like, if people want to research psychedelics, where would where do they go? Where's the where's the information? I said, well, it's all over. You know, it's in journals. <laughs> so that's she, the truth. It's true. And she said, well, isn't there any central place, if you want to go research psych the history of scientific research on psychedelics, some place where you could go and there would be all, I said, no, not to my knowledge. And so she decided that she would do that. And um, she came, Purdue is an unlikely place to do it, I might add. Purdue, of course, is in the middle of the Midwest, very conservative place, an engineering and agriculture school, land-grant college. Um, the liberal arts tradition here is is uh, pretty flimsy, uh, just because I think it's a land grant college that was established to study agriculture and engineering. And uh, I said, "Wow," I said, "You know, it's kind of an unlikely place to do it." And she said, "Well, I can go someplace else." But she says, "You're you're one of the leaders in the field, and you know you're there, and it seems like it would make sense to do it at Purdue." So I said, "Well, okay," and I was pretty hesitant at first, um, and she met and said, you know, I'm going to put some money in here and let's see if we can make this happen. And So we started collecting things. Unfortunately, so many things now are becoming digital and hard copies are so hard to find, but we're still collecting. We have a lot of papers from the early years. We're still trying to collect papers from the early years. And the distinction for this archive is there's so many things about the turbulent 60s and Timothy Leary and all that stuff. We said, let's just focus on the scientific end of it. Let's find the, the people that have done you know, research, you know, such as it was back then and into the present time, and start this collection so that there will be a place where if people want to study this field, they can go. And I, I really see it now if, if the things that Hefter's doing and, you know, MAPS just finished, a, Rick Dobbins' MAPS just studied, finished a study using MDMA and a PTSD. It's online now. It's officially been published where they showed dramatic effects with MDMA in, in uh, PTSD patients. So they're going to expand that, I know. And it may, it may well, it's my hope, it may well be that uh, as these studies start to gain some momentum, if our studies in, in New York University and Johns Hopkins are are successful and demonstrate efficacy like we think they will, that there will be sort of a, a, a momentum will start to build and this will develop into a field of psychiatry, maybe a special field of psychiatry. And then people may say, well, you know, how did this get started? When did it get started? And actually, this archive has been going on for a few years now. This would be the place where we would hope that a lot of that stuff would be documented. Uh, a lot of the correspondence and letters and things might be here. All my stuff I've told.